how can we live more sustainable? Actually, there is as many uh, definitions of permaculture as there is as many permaculturists out there. But one simple definition is that permaculture is just nothing but a method methodology that is inspired by nature and traditional knowledge. It is a holistic design approach that better integrate human elements into natural settings in a permanently sustainable way. There is a few key words on this definition and that is holistic design. So we are not going to think about growing our own food. When I'm going to be talking in this presentation, it is not only about just your garden, but how can we better integrate or hold uh, all the human elements that exist on a house and using nature to our benefit and all and all and designing or structures or or different elements according to what nature is doing instead of going against it so that is why permaculture has been really valuable for me because it has given me the tools in an organized way or a methodology that helps me better understand what's going on in my surroundings in order to take better decisions. Permaculture is nothing but thinking about how to do things instead of just doing things. It is also, I like to call it just common sense. So, I just wanted to share that definition with you and kind of start opening up the framework to some of the things that we're going to be talking about. Permaculture is about relationships in between things, not only thinking about elements as an isolated thing in our design, but how each thing connects with each other. If we have a garden, how that garden connects with your compost and how the compost connects with your kitchen and how your kitchen connects with yourself and how we are creating closed loops into our design. And of course, making it easier for us. This is a really busy slide, so I apologize, but I just want you to take closer look to the bigger letters in the center of each circle that we see there. Permaculture is um, sustained by three very important ethics. And these are questions that we ask ourselves as we take decisions. The three ethics of permaculture or the foundation are earth care, which is all the things that are in regards of the environmental, we also talk about people care, which is all the social aspect. And we also talk about fair share. Earth care, people care, and fair share, and how the environmental, the social, and the economic overlap with each other. So we see in this Venn diagram how people care and earth care earth care, we're talking about how the social environmental aspect and how we start taking decisions as we uh, start working with our design and our design can mean our landscape or can also mean our workplace, the way we carry on a meeting, things like that are these and we ask our questions. Is this decision that we're going to take about right now of this thing that we're going to buy actually is going to help us to protect the ecosystems that's taking care of the earth? Is, it, is this going to help us to preserve some of our local species? Once again, I want you to take a look at this really briefly. I'm gonna be sharing with you this presentation. And the main takeaways from this slide is earth care, people care, fair share. These are the ethics of permaculture and the foundation that is going to help us to take better decisions as we move forward with our design. So let's get into design. I think 
once we start thinking about designing one place and for the purpose of the workshop today, I think I'm going to focus a little bit more on an urban environment, a house on a neighborhood, let's say. But I want you to also know area that I'm going to be sharing with you. It could be any common scenario, everyone's house, but it can be applied. These permaculture principles and designs can be applied to a really macro level to like a whole neighborhood or to a whole city, or it can be applied to something such as small as a container garden. I want this is something that you can definitely apply to all the different levels depending on what your needs are. But the, for the purpose of this workshop today, I'm going to be focusing mostly on an urban environment, our house. And something that we need to consider when we do permaculture design is who always start looking at or site map. We're gonna call it site map or base map. And what is a site map or a base map? It's nothing but all of the buildings that exist on site. You can actually draw it by hand like this and start, is, this is your property, let's say, which is, would be really nice to have such a property with so many trees, right? But you always want to have a list of all of the things that are existing already there. Let's say you buy a house and you are going to move in and you're going to want to do a permaculture design on your house, a sustainable uh, garden design, let's call it that way. Well, first thing that you want to do is start mapping it out. What is already on place? What does exist already on that property? And you're going to start with the house. You're going to start with if there is an outdoor extra structure, let's draw it up as close as good as you can. And you're going to also draw each one of the trees that are already there. You're also going to start doing pretty much everything that it is physical, and you're going to represent it on that map. If you're not very good at drawing, do not worry. That's my case. So what I usually do is... Si I no eres bueno dibujando... Entonces, um, tienes la opción de tomarla en Google Maps y es también más sencillo para ti si no sabes. You all are getting all of the physical elements that exist on the place that you're going to be implementing your design. So that's our first step. Our second step that we're going to do is called the sector map. Sector map is very important because this is the one that is going to help us identify what's happening in that location. Once we have all the physical elements on it, we need to start thinking about all the elements on nature that interact with that location. And we're going to be talking about how the sun moves through that space every year through all the different seasons of the year. If there is any winds, well, where do the wind comes from in the summer? Where does the wind come on the winter? If there is any rainfall that falls in the city where you're located, how much rain are you getting a year? And where does it land? You know, is your property has most of the water coming from the east or west or north and south all of those things are very important to start thinking about we're also going to think about okay if there is any other sources of water such as i mean you're using your uh, washer machine where is that water going to noise if you have a street that has a lot of noise nearby or some neighbors maybe it's important to start thinking about this and start representing it on your map. One way of doing this is, for example, we can go like this. Once you have drawn your map, first thing that you want to do is locate where north is. 
where north, once you know where north is in your property, then the opposite side is south and east and west. With this information, and especially if you're located on the Sonoran Desert, this is going to allow you to know what the sun is going to be doing for uh, the whole seasons of the year. We know that during the winter time, the sun is going to be 33 degrees above the horizon on the south. It's going to come out on the east and you can see it on that blue line. The blue line on this drawing is telling you what the winter sun is going to do every single year. That's not going to ever change. That interaction is going to happen with your property all year long. I mean, every year. As the spring start coming, the sun is going to start getting higher and higher on the horizon. That's your green line. We know now that during the months of uh, March and April and September and October, the sun is going to have that trajectory. That's your green line. And then we know during the hottest months of the year, which is June, July, the summer months, the sun is going to be about 20 degrees above your head going north. So the sun is going to be beating your house really hard on the west side. So why is this information even important for us to know? Well, let's think about it. Now we know when the sun is right here, is the summer hottest months, right? And I, let me ask you a question. What is the hottest month of the year in the Sonoran Desert? Usually June, July. And if we start thinking about what is the hottest hour of the day, we're going to think about 2, 3, 4 p.m. It gets really hot here. Well, what can we do about it? And how can we use that information? These are all very important questions that we're going to ask right here. It's going to be beating our house. And we also know that during the winter months, the sun is going to be beating right here. The sun, uh, the, the southernmost part of our house. One thing is important to map on this, uh, on, our, on our base map that I actually forgot to mention about is if you have any utilities, gas lines and water lines, put them in your design map. This information is important, especially we're digging holes, right? You don't wanna hit a big gas line there and have a leak, that could be really bad. These are information that it is important to represent in our map. And if there is any water sources like spigots and where they are located at, let's say that this house has two over there. And this is, December 31st, we know that the sun is going to be hitting our southern window right here, and it's going to, that's our best, uh, the, our best chance to warm our house. Okay, so we have mapped this, and we know here in, this, in the Sonoran Desert, the wind comes from the southwest, so we know that there is going to be some wind blowing on these windows right here. All right, and I know that the high point of this property is going to be the north side of the property. And when it rains, the water is going to travel from the high point through the low point. We're mapping out all of for the different things, all the structural things or side map has. And we are also mapping all the sectors, all the things that are interacting with our house. All right, so where do I put my garden now that I know all this information? What can I do, you know? So now that we know that we have all these different patterns moving through our property, then we can start making better decisions. So for example, 
if I want to plant a tree, I know now because what the sun will be doing during the hottest months that the best place to plant a tree that is going to give me shade is going to be on the west house of the house. And that sun that was beating this part of the house, keeping my house really hot, now it's going to have the protection of this tree and the shade that is going to keep our house cool during this summer months. And actually, I'm not only going to put one because I know how hot it gets here. I'm going to put two, actually three, and why not four? So important that we provide here as much shade as possible, especially on the west side of our houses. With trees in the Sonoran Desert that provide the best shade is the native trees like mesquite or palo verde or ironwood. These are trees that are perfectly adapted to our ecosystem here that can spend a lot of time without water. They also grow relatively fast. They produce really nice shade. They produce food. We can eat the mesquite pods, for example. We can eat the seeds of the palo verde tree. We can eat the flowers of the ironwood. And they are all legumes. What that means is that they will put nitrogen in our soils. Excellent trees to plant always on the west side of the house and shade our house. Once we know this information also, remember I had a lot of wind coming through the uh, southwest. So why not put the wind barrier here? And we can start thinking about plants that are going to protect our house from these strong winds of the summertime and keeping our house cooler as well. We want to also think about trees on the south end that are small. We don't want to put trees that are really big on the south end because this is where the winter sun is coming in and is warming up our house. What I want you to think about is that all during by doing this design is going to translate on saving a lot of money. Every year in Arizona or any state that is located on these climates that are very extreme, we spend a lot of time, a lot of money with our air conditionings and also with our heating. So by allowing more of that Southern sun to hit those windows on the South end, in the winter time, that's going to keep our house warm. So we don't rely so much on using our heater. By cooling our house on the hottest months, by putting shade on the west side, we're also not going to be depending so much on an air conditioning. All that is going to translate to savings in our pockets. And we are just using what nature is telling us. Nature is not going to change this pattern, but we can change the way that we think and place things around our house. So for the east side, I'm going to put, because it's nice to have, you know, that sun in the morning right here. So I'm going to put some trees that are going to drop all of their leaves in the winter, but they're going to provide nice shade on the summer. So during the winter, this house is going to get that sun, but during the summer, all these trees are going to grow and also provide, cast some shade and keep our house cool from the morning on the summer months. So these are called deciduous trees or are trees that drop all of their leaves. And I put a couple of cactus there because I love cactus. These are uh, plants that we can get a lot of food from and we don't have to really take care of them. Like prickle pear cactus, wonderful plant, and choyas, they provide so many benefits and food for uh, pollinators, food for ourselves, and also 
they don't require many resources. Uh, so now we start thinking, okay, well, I see I have all this shaded area. I have my kitchen right here. So I think for me, in order to start building my soil and maybe a compost pile will be right underneath the shade right here because compost actually needs moisture. So we don't wanna put it like right here where it's going to get uh, no shade at all or right over here, like on the far north or very far from the kitchen. It just makes it hard for us. So we find a place that is nearby that we can get easy from our kitchen that already is getting a lot of shade and debris from all those trees that are going to complement our compost pile. And that might be a really good place to do it. Now, because I know there is going to be moisture for this compost pile, well, that would be a great place to put my fruit tree. I'm going to plant a fig tree, a pomegranate, a citrus tree right next to my compost pile because it's going to get a lot of nutrients from it. And it also is going to get some of the moisture. So when I water either one of them, I know that it's going to be benefiting. I'm, I'm working in two things at once. In permaculture, they call these stacking functions. The one thing is not only doing one thing, but is doing multiple things at once. I'm getting my food here. I have some shade that is going to protect this tree. And I have the moisture from my compost pile. And it's already, uh, I'm not gonna be able to get the nutrients from the compost pile into my fruit tree as well. So, how about putting a garden around here? All this shade of the west side is going to make sure that our garden keeps protected, not only by the wind that is going to dry our garden in the summer, we have our wind barrier, we have the house protecting it, and we have all this shade. And it's going to get the necessary sun in the morning a little bit in the middle of the day, and then the sun is gonna go away during the hottest time of the day, and our garden is going to save so much water doing it that way. This is really important. As we live in the desert, water is a very uh, important commodity that we don't have as much. So the more ways that we can find to save water, the more that we will be uh, doing this in the most sustainable way. <clears throat> so this is a really good place for a garden. And also if you wanna do winter gardening also right here on the south uh, end, it's a good place. You don't wanna put your garden too close to the house because then the house will be shading your garden on the winter time, which if you have done gardening in the winter, we know is some of the best uh, is when we get some of the best results during our winter months. So make sure that if you decide to put your garden in the north, at least make sure it's not too close to a house that will shade or garden on the winter hours. So now we can start putting some flowers. Why not? It's important that when we think about a garden, we think about all the vegetables that we can grow for ourselves, but always, always complement your garden with flowers that it could be edible as well, but they can also are going to bring pollinators into your space that are going to help to keep this ecosystem thriving and healthy. So I just threw some flowers there. I also decided to do some container gardening and the best place I found was right here. So we get some of that nice Eastern sun in all times of the year, but then during the uh, hottest months, the shade of the house is going to protect these containers and it's gonna give it a really nice um, look to the front of the house. And as I already have a gas line coming in here, well, I know that I cannot make 
too much holes in there. So putting a container right over those gas lines, that is a great solution for that type of space. And just for fun, I threw a couple more pictures. And once we have our design, we can sit down and relax in our chair. I want you to take a look at this. And as I said, you know, this is just very briefly, I tried to figure out how uh, ways to describe how can we use all this, but, but this is the easier way I found. So we can see the sun pattern and how can we use this information. And now we're cooling our house. We are heating our house in the winter. We are saving water by putting these trees as well near our garden. We are taking care of the environment by adding some plants that native, uh, native species of animals can also enjoy, not only thinking about ourselves. We are also thinking <clears throat> about the resources that are on site and how can we recycle them and integrate them. So every time, we are creating less waste. We know also that the house is going to have the high point in the roof and we'll see that the rainwater is going to travel here. And we can integrate this rainwater into the plants that we have in the front. And we are creating a holistic design that takes in consideration all of the elements around your space and integrates them on a way that makes sense on a way that we're taking care of ourselves, we're taking care of the earth, and we are designing for a more sustainable uh, human um, habitat. So when we think about permaculture, that's, that's, that's what it is. We are learning how to make an observation and act accordingly, like, taking a look at all these patterns that interact in these different sites and use them uh, in the best way possible to create a more sustainable way of living. If I were going to put, let's say, all of these shade trees right here in the south end, it's going to shade that winter sun and our house is going to get really cold in the winter. If I have only small plants and isolated fruit trees right here, I know that they're going to take way more water than if I plant them under the shade. So by thinking about these things before doing, we're already saving ourselves a lot of money and a lot of resources. Okay, now we're going to get a little bit on the techniques, you know. Now you're all good permaculture designers, you know how to read the landscape. You know that when you move into a place, you know what to look for. You know that considering the sun, it is very important. Finding where north is, it's going to tell you what the sun is going to do uh, during the year. You're going to ask questions, you know, like sometimes when we get to a place that we don't know so much, it's super important to talk to locals because that's where the, the knowledge is. People that has been in these places for lots of years. Things like, for example, if you move to a place, you might not know where uh, where does the wind comes on the on the on the summertime or in the winter time. So you ask these questions, then you find the slope, then you know what the water is going to do during uh, during a rain. All of these things are going to help you to start thinking about the decisions that need to happen, or the placing of the elements and the relationships amongst them. We're gonna talk a little bit about soils, but I'm not gonna go very deep into this conversation because we're going to have a, our future workshop is going to be just on soils. But, but one thing I just wanna mention really briefly is just what are we dealing with? We know that our desert soils they have very low microorganisms. So they're not very alive. They don't have too much organic matter. They have very little to no nutrients. 
they are very compacted, which is one of the biggest issues. And they have high pH, which means they're very alkaline. So that's basically the description of a desert soil is the opposite of a healthy soil. Because when we're thinking about a healthy soil, we think about it's full of microorganisms, it's high on organic matter, there is no toxins or pesticides. It is it's balanced. The pH is very porous, so the water can sink in, dip in, and it has very good tilt and structure. It's, it's, it's not dusty or it's not compacted. So that's a good soil. And I'm going to invite you, our next workshop is going to help us understand how can we get from a desert soil to a healthy soil. How can we get it to that? Because we're thinking about this, you know, a compost pile that is full of nutrients and is going to help us to grow all the food that we want to grow here in the desert. If we go and right now start digging holes in our yard without really working on the desert soil, get it to a, a, a good healthy soil, our plants are not going to thrive. We're thinking about plants that if we have a very compacted soil, this, the plant is going to try to grow the roots and then it's going to collapse because it cannot penetrate that soil. So what we do here in the desert, it's one of the techniques that we usually recommend is called the double dig technique. Double digging, is nothing but digging a hole about a foot and a half to two feet deep. And all of the soil that you extract, you're going to sift it and get all the rocks out. And you get with that fine soil from the desert. And you're going to mix that fine desert soil with finished compost, 50% to 50% ratio. You're gonna mix it and you're gonna put it back into that hole again. And that's going to give you a good start for a garden. I'm going to, in the email that I will be sending to everybody, I'm going to share a step-by-step -step video where you your house. So very simple, it does require some, uh, some work, but, once, but requires very little investment, which is one of the great things about it. All right, so let's say we already decided where our garden is going to be, how big it's going to be. Now we're going to start thinking, what are we going to plant this summer? What some of the things that we're going to get into our, our garden bed? You know, when you go get some seeds, I usually recommend that get some seeds that are, that take less time to mature. That means that you get some food faster. I also suggest always to ask around or to local gardeners, what has people has been growing successfully already? Because there is a lot of traditional knowledge in your area and i'm sure about that because this is nothing new people has been growing vegetables on their yards for since yards are a thing so since the beginning of time basically so you just need to uh, reach out to the elders the people has been doing this work and we're gonna get a lot of valuable information if you don't get local seeds at least make sure that you read the package. You know, when you get, uh, if you go to a local seed store, and in some places I understand that there is not much selections and or uh, options are very limited. So if you are able, I would suggest to promote and um, organic produce seeds and support organic produce seeds and also Pay full attention to some of the information that you will find on the package. Like, for example, if it's heat tolerant, as we're going to start the spring summer season, make sure that these seeds, like 
for example, tomatoes. We usually love to grow tomatoes in the winter, but one thing about tomatoes is a lot of the seeds that we find here is from tomatoes that are like all the way from Wisconsin or places where our climate is very different. So it's always better to learn around or ask around what are some of the tomatoes that do best on the desert. My advice is always go for the smaller sizes like cherry tomatoes, sun gold tomatoes, even Roma tomatoes. But the bigger the tomato, also the more water that it will take and they are less heat tolerant. Here in Tucson, we have a variety called Nichols, uh, which I would suggest is a, what we call a heirloom variety. Heirloom varieties are varieties of plants that have been grown in the same area for a lot of different generations, which what allows the plant to adapt to the conditions of that area. So this is a tomato that has been grown in the Sonoran Desert for over 50 years, I think 50 to 80 years. So now the, the seed has the capacity and the fruit to adapt to these conditions of lack of water, extreme sun. So these are things that are going to help us to have a better results when we grow our plants. But of course, you know, if you don't like tomatoes, don't grow tomatoes. Always think about the things that you like. The more that you like the plants, because like in the summertime, you know, basil does really good, for example, but some people don't like basil. So there is other ways uh, to think about the plants that we want to grow and the functions that they will have in our garden that we have options, right? And also think about your garden friends, like all the bees and all of the uh, different uh, microorganisms that live in the soil, because there is a lot of plants that have different functions. So for example, uh, I mentioned earlier legumes, like beans. If we plant beans in our garden, we are ready fertilizing with nitrogen or garden because as I mentioned earlier legumes have the amazing quality of absorbing the nitrogen from the atmosphere and putting it into the soil so we have this wonderful uh, plant that we can use and we even if we are not going to uh, have beans as production if we have a few scattered around our garden it's already producing our fertilizer. For example, on the picture, you see a, a daikon radish. They call those the miners, right? Uh, all of the root vegetables, they're very important to plant in the winter because they're going to reach very deep into the soil and they're going to bring nutrients from the bottom up and make them accessible to other plants that might not have very deep root systems like lettuce, for example. So putting a daikon radish next to a lettuce, it is a very good way to have a companion garden. In the summer, some of the best companion gardens, for example, are tomatoes with uh, basil. That's people swear that the basil always gives better taste to your tomatoes. Um, also, when we think about plants, uh, there is some plants that are going to help us to repel some of the insects. And the best one for the summer times is marigolds. Marigolds in Espanol is Sempasuchil. It's a great plant that we can always put around our garden and repels all of the insects that we don't want that will try to eat our garden. This is a, a small tip of how to uh, plant your seeds. When, you're, when you have your seed in your hand, always look about the size. If let's say right now is the season of the squash, squash is about, it's a bigger seed, right? So you wanna go two to, two to three times the size of the seed. And that's how deep you're going to put it into the ground. You don't want to go very deep 
like a full hole and then throw it on the bottom of the hole, cover it, well, that seed's not gonna come up. If you're working with a seed that is very small, you just basically spread it on the top and rake it and use a little bit of dirt covering and that's enough. For other things, like for example, beans, if you soak them for 24 hours, it's going to break the outdoor, um, it has a film on the, that protects the seed. So that's, if you soak it for 24 hours, it's going to help to break that coating and it's going to sprout much easier and you'll probably have better success. When you get some seeds, if they're really old, I would suggest to plant two or three seeds on the same hole of the same seed because the sprouting rate, it's going to be less than it is from a new seed. So if you have new seeds, one should be enough. And if you have two, uh, you have very old seeds, you can plant two or three on the same hole. Also spacing is important. If you're going to put, uh, it's always very good to know how big this plant is going to grow. When we have a seed or a seedling in our hand, so small, and we want to put them all together, but we also got to allow the plants to, to develop health in a healthy way. For example, tomatoes that will be growing this season, usually about 12 inches in between is a good size. It's a good size in between each one of them. So for plants that are smaller, six inches, it is, is also, so small plants, six inches, bigger plants, 12 inches. This is a little bit of what I just shared before. Always think about how big it's going to get. And this is important because if we go back to our thinking on the sun, the sun patterns, we know in the summertime, if we want to grow corn, for example, the best place to grow corn will be on the west side of our garden. That way the corn is going to shade in the hottest time of the day, the rest of our other vegetables. So using that pattern, we're already creating a micro ecosystem that is going to benefit and protect our plants. In the winter time, for example, if we're growing radishes and lettuce, we want to put those in the south side of the garden so they have access to that sun and the taller plants are going to go on the north side because if we would have done it the other way around, the plants, on, the plants that grow bigger, they will be shading the smaller plants on the north side. If you can draw this on paper according to the seeds that you have, it's going to help you create your design on a better way, just like you did with your whole property. It is important. And you can translate this information also to a container as well. So companion, marigolds I mentioned, another excellent repellent is garlic and delicious also. And if you wanna attract beneficial insects because not all the insects are bad. We're talking about insects that are going to help us take care of all the bad insects. Like for example, um, ladybugs. If you put dill, cilantro and all of the parsley family. These are excellent plants. And that's the, the picture that you see on the top. Once they start going to flower, you're gonna see an amazing amount of ladybugs coming and visiting your garden. And they're gonna go after every aphid that they find because that's their main source of food. So I would highly suggest to always put some of the parsley family there. So these are some of the great warm season crops that uh, we enjoy growing here in the desert. And of course there is the tomatoes, the basil, chilies, grow chilies this summer. One of the best ones is uh, the chiltepin of course, which is the 
uh, endemic pepper from this area. But if you, uh, you can also grow things like serrano, that's really good on the heat. Uh, I've seen serranos on temperatures of 120 degrees and they still producing strong. Jalapenos will be my second, my third choice. Also habaneros and pretty much every pepper will do good. One of the things that uh, th I haven't seen doing that good is bell peppers in this environment, but you can give it a try. They usually don't get as big as you will find on a store, but I mean, and they don't produce as many, but all of the spicy peppers do really good in the desert. Eggplant. Eggplant is a wonderful plant that produces a lot of food and it is also very heat tolerant. Grow your eggplant. Squash as well. If you can grow, uh, Tohono Otam has grown uh, high hal squash. It's a native squash from this area. You can get seeds from there, from them. It's a wonderful squash that produces a lot of food and is very heat tolerant as well. Cucumbers, Armenian cucumber. It is a cucumber that grows really big and it is extremely heat tolerant as well. Corn, corn you wanna grow uh, in the summertime too. You can start growing it at the end of March or plant it on June 28th, beginning of July because that's when the monsoon or the summer rain starts in this area. So that's also a really good time. Traditionally, that's the way it has been done. The Hono Otam had developed uh, a variety of corn called the 60 day corn. There is a corn that will produce fruit in just 60 days. That just takes on the monsoon season and and by the end of the monsoon season, you can start harvesting your corn. One thing about corn, it is a plant that requires a lot of nitrogen. So you got to make sure that you provide extra fertilizer for those plants as well. We're going to talk a little bit about fertilizers in a second. Okra. If you don't like okra, well, you should change your mind. It is a delicious, very nutritional vegetable. Uh, it has a funny texture, but it does really good and it's extremely productive on the summer months here in the desert. Sweet potatoes, the greens coming from the sweet potatoes are edible and they produce a lot of them, so you can eat them as well. Malabar spinach, it is a climbing variety of spinach that does really good in the summer months. Of course, beans. Uh, Ejotes and all of the uh, green beans will do good in the, in the summer months. And don't forget to eat the weeds as well. Here in the desert, we have amazing weeds that are edible and they're highly nutritional, such as the quelites. When they're young and tender, right after the rain, they're excellent food. And my favorite from all is the purslane. Purslane. In Espanol, se llama verdolaga. The purslane, it is an amazing plant. And we have it in a very abundant way here in the desert. So if you find a good one out in the desert, collect the seeds and spread them in your garden because it's a plant that will produce so much food. All of the plants' uh, parts are edible except the root. And it has a high a uh, high nutrient content it has it is one of the most nutritional greens that you can find and it is the easier one to grow and it is very heat tolerant as well those are one of those are some of my favorite things that i will grow in the desert always check uh, i'm going to be sending you a list of all of these plants on the email that will follow up and also uh, the list for the winter uh, and when to transition. Because one thing I've learned about growing food in the desert, it is about timing. You wanna do this when, uh, when it's the right time to do it. If you do it too early, plants might freeze. If you do it too late, then they will not fully develop before the next season comes in, before the next, uh, 
Same thing with the winter plants. If you plant them too early and it's still really hot out there, the plant is going to bolt. The flower is going to come up and it's not going to develop any, any uh, greens that we can eat. I'm gonna make a quick pause because I see a few questions. Uh, Jimmy, I'm going to talk about water on the next slide. Uh, uh, Katia, I see you're planting in buckets. I'm going to talk about self-watering containers in a second. That might be a good option for you. Ana Adela, uh, Es diferente, so it's different, uh, Ana Adela, para dependiendo de si eh, tenemos dos temporadas. Depending on the two different seasons, in spring and summer versus fall and winter, those times of our March, wait, I'm going to send you all the calendar. Thank you the questions that were on the on the chat as well in the following in the following slides healthy seedlings when you go out and buy to the store you're going to find all kinds of stuff you know for example these tomato seedlings this is what you want to get like the one on the picture that has the white background right there we have a healthy seedling that is ready to go on the ground now in the other picture, you can see some seedlings that have been sitting on a very small container and they have developed really long. And those are not the ones that you wanna get. You wanna get them between the first two stages before they get like this, because that's already putting a shock in your plant and it's already putting a lot of stress and the plant is not going to develop optimally. So we want to make sure that when we are out there selecting our plants, that we select the best, uh, the best size. And the one that I would usually suggest is the smaller sizes. Sometimes we go to the store and we see a plant that already has fruit on it and it's really big and it's in this small container. And we say, wow, it's already putting fruit. That's the one I want because it's gonna be easy. But if we actually get it smaller on this size, it's going to really, have the time to adapt to the environment where we are transplanting them to. And it's going to, once it adapts and we're doing a good job, the plant is going to produce a lot of food for ourselves. You just gotta be patient. On the other hand, if we put it a very fully developed plant, it can be a really big shock because it was used to that environment and it was already triggered to produce food. So if we transplant them, it might not have the results that you might want. So get just the smaller size, just like this. And of course, you're not gonna be the only one that is going to try to eat your vegetables. There is a lot of different critters out there in the desert, like the aphids. And these ones that will try to go on your zucchini and all different kinds of bugs. And before we even actually try to do something about them, it's important to know what are we dealing with. So think, observe, and research before you start putting a, a pesticide on it. Some of the easier ways to do it is by picking things by hand, because for example, in the, we're going to have, uh, in the summertime, it's very common that we have uh, caterpillars trying to eat our tomatoes. The best way to do it is just take your time, get to your plant and take them one by one out of there, feed them to your chickens, add them to your compost, whatever you wanna do with them. If you have a lot of aphids and you still do not have a lot of ladybugs helping you, soapy spray works really good. Any organic spray or biodegradable spray will do. Just mix it with water and spray it directly where you see the problem. So, but yeah, focus on creating an ecosystem that it is beneficial for all these insects to, or the beneficial insects to come into your garden and do a diverse garden. You know, don't do 
only tomatoes don't do only squash if you put tomatoes and squash and all that you're not putting all of your eggs in one basket so when the what's going to happen if you get a pest on that variety in particular is going to take you a whole crop but if you put a lot of diverse plants then it's going to take one but you're going to have all of these other elements that are going to support your garden so organic fertilizer I will suggest if you are into, if you want and you're just starting your garden, it's important that we fertilize at the beginning. And I will suggest doing it by either getting organic fertilizer. You can buy this in, in, in any store, but you can make your own. And one of the things I would suggest is compost tea. It is the best way to inject a lot of microorganisms into your soil and get it ready because what fertilizers do, they feed directly on the plant. And what things like the compost tea is going to feed the soil with microorganisms and the microorganisms are going to feed the plant. And that is the most successful way of doing it because you are creating a healthy living soil that it is taking care of your plants and not and you're not gonna rely on organic fertilizer every time you plant you're creating a living soil and that's the ultimate goal that we want to create once you have a living soil then you don't have to worry about so much of buying fertilizers or preparing fertilizers every time we plant i highly suggest to join the next workshop on healthy soils so you can get more information about how to do all of these techniques to get to a point where your soils are living and healthy and your plants are thriving. Oh no, what's trying to eat my veggies? Yeah, there's other things that also will try to eat your veggies like rodents. Here in the Sonoran Desert, we have uh, gophers. There's uh, different ways that we try to uh, get rid of these guys but one by scaring them away there is different uh, methods that will create sound on the soil so they don't like sound so you can like put our uh, they sell these probes that go into the soil that create a noise and scare them away that is the most humane way of getting rid of them also, uh, some people buy traps that actually will trap them and kill them. So gophers are a big problem. If you let them, uh, they will take a, having one or two is not a problem, but they can reproduce really fast. And there is definitely a need for you to uh, keep the populations under control. Otherwise, they're going to create a lot of damage. The best way to recognize is you'll see mounds of dirt that are very clean. And also you'll see plants that the whole plant still there, but it just wilted and you lift it and, and the roots are going to be gone. They mostly eat the roots. And then we have our uh, Juancitos or prairie dogs that they don't eat as much, but having like native foods around your garden, it is also a way to control them because these guys, they love to eat native food. So having a mesquite tree around your garden or uh, some of the natural sources of food for them, you can, uh, you can control that. Fencing is also recommended if you live on an area where there is uh, other things that could potentially damage your garden, such as dogs or uh, javelina or some of the Sonoran desert creatures. So when we're harvesting, make sure that it's all a continuous harvest. We're going to not necessarily take the whole plant. You want to harvest 30% if it's a green and let it keep growing. So it will continue to produce. Also, once you, if you have several of these plants, always observe which plant did the best. If you had some tomatoes that produce a whole bunch of tomatoes, Keep a mature tomato of that so you can save seeds. This is going to help you a lot for the future so you don't have to be depending on buying seeds again. 
There is multiple videos on internet of how can you save seeds from all different plants that you can imagine. This is such a great way of continuing your work because you're getting seeds from plants that you know that you like, plants that you know that they do good in that environment in particular. So it is always good for you to start saving your own seeds. And of course, sharing with your friends. And I'm going to tell you this, you might not be uh, happy to hear it, but yes, you're going to fail sometimes a lot. So there are some things that are not going to do good, but that is just part of the learning lessons. We can see, we can participate as many webinars like this and go to as many classes. But if we don't actually go out there and get our hands dirty and really start building that relationship with ourselves and the soil and the plants, then we're not going to have su uh, success. So I think always observe, pay attention to what's happening learn from what's happening take some notes if you're a note person and do not forget to enjoy it you know like if it's something that is not an enjoyable activity you might not need to uh you might want to consider another one right but it is uh i i can almost guarantee that you will enjoy it well somebody asked me about water and i just put up this slide right here because this is a question that comes very often you know what's the best way of doing it i highly suggest actually uh, investing on a drip irrigation system because that way we know that the drip is going to fall right where the plant is located at because we're going to lay our irrigation system and the drip is going to be allocated or the plant is going to be allocated right where the emitter is and the meter is where the drop of water will come up from so there is a whole video on youtube that we have that i'm going to pass on the email of how can you do this at home with things that you can find in your local hardware store and it's nothing you can connect this to a, a hose uh, spigot and one thing I would suggest that is actually missing on this slide is to have a timer. Timer that works, operates with batteries. And you know that your garden is going to be getting water every day. And you don't have to be there because that we do sometimes is we water where it. Uh, it's a technique that we use a lot. We go out with the hose and water at the time that we can, you know, and usually like during the middle of the day, we're gonna go out there and spray all of our plants. There is a lot of water that we lose through evaporation. We water the plants. A lot of that water falls on the leaves and the leaves are already hot. Then you land the water on that and it's going to evaporate. So we're losing a lot of water that way. So I definitely believe that investing on a irrigation system, that it is a drip irrigation system that you can find in your local hardware store, it is the best way to go if you're doing in the ground. Because we don't wanna have, especially in the summer, if you miss one or two days without water in your garden, your plants are going to die. So, and we don't so want to have the chance to go out for the weekend. You know, we don't want to be completely stuck to the garden every day. We want to make sure that we have time to do other things as well, go on vacation and things like that. So getting into a automatic timer is a great idea. To complement that, do mulch, 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 mulch. You cannot add so much of this mulch is just a thick layer of organic matter around your plants this is going to help with multiple things prevent evaporation so we have the drip line right under the mulch and the mulch is protecting your drip line and protecting all the water that is getting into the roots of your plants and as it decomposes with the time it's also going to add nutrients to your plants so Mulch can be any organic matter such as hay, 
alfalfa, or just broken leaves from the tree that you have at your nearby park. Just put about an inch of a layer around your plants. It might not look as good as the other picture, but believe me, desert gardens shouldn't look so tidy. Like it should actually look full of mulch and protecting that soil from the really strong sun that we have. And we're going to protect the water as much as we can so it doesn't evaporate so quickly. Complement that with a shade cloth if your trees on the west side are not enough. I, can, I cannot really say how much I encourage in the summertime to have a shade cloth as well because that's going to help us create that microclimate that our plants need. Also, put plants really, once they grow, you know, like very thick gardens, it's important because the plants help each other out and shade each other out. And it's not, uh, so we don't wanna put one plant there, another plant there. So let's try to keep it as, to, as tight together as we can. Of course, keeping in mind how big these plants are going to grow. So we got mulch, we got shade cloth, we got drip irrigation, we're good to go. If you want, there is other ways of irrigation I will briefly mention, such as clay ollas. This is a Chinese technique that was as 4,000 years old, which consists on a clay olla and you put the water and the, the clay will allow the moisture to come out very slowly into the soil. So that's a, that's a way to, if you have a shaded garden, it works really good. Winter gardens do really good. You can buy these, order them online, or you can make yourself one by putting together two clay pots from the dollar store, sealing, uh, glue them together and sealing one of the ends and, and leaving the other one open so you can add the water. You bury the whole thing inside and you're good to go. Somebody mentioned about containers, doing it on a bucket, for example. And those are really good ways of gardening as well, especially if you are in an area that don't have much uh, space to grow on the ground. So, and you can move these things around, right? But one of the ways that I would suggest is doing it on a self-watering container. So you can actually put the water here, get this water inside here uh, on a water reservoir and the water will slowly, the moisture will travel up into your soil mix. And it's a very highly efficient way of watering. There is a full video on our YouTube channel where you can see step-by-step -step of how to build one of these. I am also just show an example of how a good well-designed can be, you know, that we integrate all of the elements together. We know that the water comes from the roof. We can save some water by doing rainwater harvesting in an active way. We have an overflow that integrates into a landscape that is full of native plants, winter trees, and they all benefit from all. We got even a fruit tree there. And we got a lot of fruit trees that are, um, or plants that produce food here in the desert that is important to take a look at. I would suggest uh, to take a look at desert harvesters and also uh, Brad Lancaster's website about rainwater harvesting and plants. I'm going to add the links to the email that I'll be sending you later. I'm going to right now, I know we're just run out of time, but I want to thank you, everybody. And I'm going to have some time just to make sure that if there is any more questions on, on the Q&A.